Hi and welcome to Green Tubers. Today I'm going to talk you through the facts and figures for running our air source heat pump for the last year. Now this video is a follow-up to the review I did of our Mitsubishi air source heat pump and I have to say I wasn't quite expecting the amount of traffic that we got. Now, in fairness, we're still pretty low in the YouTube rankings globally, obviously, but it did surprise me. Um, I know air source heat pumps are in the news a lot at the moment, uh, but we got far more views on that video than any of our other ones, which has been quite fun, quite exciting. Um, but it hasn't just been the fact that we've had a lot of views. The interaction with the video has been spectacular by, well at least by my standards, there have been absolutely loads of comments on there and I am honestly failing to keep up to respond to a lot of them. Um, but it does show you the, the level of interest in air source heat pumps at the moment. I'm not, going to I'm not going to claim we did a spectacular video, it's purely down to interest in air source heat pumps, which is good, it's interesting, there's a lot of discussion, there are some negative comments on there admittedly, um, but in general, people seem quite uh, at least positive about my review of the Mitsubishi and that it's helped guide one or two people on their purchases. So that's quite fun. But definitely one of the more prevalent comments uh, has uh, been a, a query or a demand in some cases for facts and figures. Now, I deliberately left out facts and figures or, or sp being too specific uh, when I did the review because our circumstances mean that I actually felt it wouldn't be very fair on Mitsubishi for me to start claiming figures um, because our situation means that um, our heat pump as it stands isn't running as efficiently as it could and therefore to start talking about our running costs meant, would mean that people might get a, a, an artificially bad idea about, uh, about what it costs to run. So. I am going to go through those figures today, but there is a huge disclaimer on on this, which is that um, uh, it's not it's not set up as efficiently as it could be, nowhere near, and therefore these figures will show inevitably that it's been relatively expensive to run. However, that in itself might well be of interest to people, so that's what I'm going to go through today. Now, why is it inefficient? Why is it not as good as it should be? Well. Um, because we didn't change anything other than the switching the oil boiler over to an air source heat pump. Um, it's well known that you, you know, ordinarily need to improve the insulation if your insulation's below par and you might need to change uh, your radiators over to ones which, um, uh, which are larger so that they, for, for a lower temperature of water flowing through them, they're still able to produce the, uh, the required amount of heat output. But we didn't do any of that. We didn't change our radiators and we haven't done anything to the insulation particularly over the last 12 months, although we did put some triple glazing in at the same time as the air source heat pump. So it's not like we've done nothing, but we were waiting to do the vast majority of the stuff until the rest of our building works was underway, which it is now. So we've ended up running for a full 12 months with old radiators and old pipe work. And so looking at the figures with that in mind, I actually think it's, it is interesting for other people to consider that and see, well, you know, how much worse off is it? We've also had time to explore the structure of our building uh, a lot more and, um, and its insulation properties. And this is something you really need to think about with an air source heat pump. It's not just the pump itself, it's what is the fabric of your building like. And I, I'm in touch with a couple of local energy consultants, fortunately live relatively nearby, and their mantra is always exactly the same. Before you're considering the technology of air source heat pumps, of solar panels, all these sort of good gadgets, which the engineer in me is sort of craving to go and put in, Actually, it's kind of the boring stuff. It's fabric first. That's the mantra. Fabric first. How is your building insulated? How is your draft proofing? All that sort of thing. And once you've got that out of the way, then you can start thinking about all the tech. Is the ideal way to do it? Now, we didn't do it that way, primarily because there was a good grant available for us at the time, and it made financial sense to switch the air source heat pump over at that point. Also with a view that 
our old oil boiler might crash on us. So we 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 made the switch probably too early, but knowing full well that we'd we would change the fabric of the building at a future date. So what have we discovered in the intervening period? Well, it turns out that our cavity walls have cavity wall insulation in them when uh, we'd assumed there was nothing. Uh, but it's not the sort of stuff you inject in uh, after the event. Um, it's actually been built with cavity wall insulation in the cavity. So 50% of the cavity is filled with board insulation, which given that this was built in the 1970s is pretty amazing. Um, the, the window fitters, obviously, they see inside cavities all the time when they lift window sills and they peer down and check everything. And they said they'd never seen it. They'd never seen a building of this age with that sort of insulation installed. So whoever did that in the past, thank you. That's really helpful. It also turns out that there was insulation in the floor throughout our uh, ground floor. Um, even in the oldest part of the house, which is mid-1700s, someone has gone to the trouble of putting a little bit of insulation in. It's not a lot, it's only a couple of centimetres, maybe three centimetres, but it all makes a difference. So that's been really good, um, but we've still been stuck with our old radiators. And they are, of course, like the rest of this house, a bit of a mixed bunch. So some of the radiators are relatively modern. They've got uh, thermostatic radiator valves on, which you can turn up and down and will control the heat within the room a, a bit. Um, but we've got plenty of other radiators which don't have uh, TLVs, the, the, uh, the valves on, um, and similarly have uh, a varying sizes of pipe work. So the pipes ought really to be a minimum of 15 millimeters, but we've got some pipes which is described as uh, microbore. So oh, I don't know how big it is, but it's tiny. And it's not really good enough to get the water flow through that you need for an air source heat pump, given that the water um, is relatively low temperature. So given that we knew um, the radiators were too old, how we've compensated is by running the air source heat pump effectively too hot. Um, a, uh, a regular boiler, you'd probably run it in the sort of 60s range, you know, 60, 65 degrees, something like that. Um, we've been running the air source heat pump at, I think, 50 or 52 uh, degrees, which is hot enough for the radiators to be fine and they feel warm to the touch, you know, nice and hot, and it's been warm enough the majority of the time, um, but it's not how an air source heat pump should be run. It should be run at sort of 30, 35 degrees, the sort of temperature you'd normally run with um, underfloor heating. So by doing so, it's meant that the heat pump has not been um, running efficiently and therefore um, the COP, the coefficient of performance, that sort of multiplier figure that you see, um, has been worse than it would be. But we went into this knowing that that would be the case. We didn't know how good or bad it would be. We knew it would be worse than it should be, but we didn't know how bad it'd be. And the reality is, it's not been that bad at all, really. Um, it's not brilliant, but it's actually not so bad. Um, on average, we've been achieving a coefficient um, of uh, two to one. So for every watt of electricity we put in, we're getting two watts of, of heat energy back out, which is which is all right. You know, it's it's not too bad. It's not it's not nearly as good as the manufacturer's target, which I think on our units around three and a half. Um, three and a half times to one, um, but it's, it's, it's okay. Um, it's meant that switching from uh, oil to air source heat pump, it's probably cost us a bit more per month. I, I'll go through the figures in a minute, um, but it's not as, as bad as it could have been. I mean, it's still, it's only a little bit more rather than, you know, orders of magnitude. It's not like tripled our heating bill or anything. It's just been a little bit more expensive and we've been fairly relaxed as we're safe in the knowledge that things can only get better really. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, fire up the computer. I've got my glasses on, it makes me look studious and also means I can see. Um, so hopefully you can see my, my screen and I'm able to share that with you. So you can see um, I have been recording for, uh, well I have been recording for a full 12 months but it, it does bear pointing out that March um, we didn't start recording until maybe the 5th or 6th of the month or something like that. So it's not, it's not a complete month. I also rather optimistically started trying to record what the average temperature was for the month and then, and then immediately gave up again. 
So what we can see is that over the course of a year we've used approximately uh, 5,000 uh, kilowatt hours of electricity and our unit has output just over double that. Um, giving us a daily usage of just under 10 kilowatt hours per day. So that's the amount of usage, not, not output. Um, so the figures I've put in there for the cost per kilowatt hour was what we were paying for electricity sometime last year. And obviously those figures have, have shot up. Um, what I figured out our uh, oil bill was per month was £67 um, and we're paying £90 per month based on the figures which were comparative with oil. So I know electricity prices have gone up but oil prices have gone up as well. So I don't know how that would reflect these days at, um, uh, at current prices but for us over the course of the last 12 months or so approximately it's cost us almost 50% more, not quite, but almost 50% more to run the air source heat pump than it would have done if we'd have stuck with oil. Uh, now, again, it's not brilliant, but uh, it does mean that um, uh, we've got room to manoeuvre and when we have the underfloor heating put in, I expect that to improve. Now, what did we pay for it? That's the other big question because it's no good saying, well, yes, look at all this money we're saving per month but what was the initial outlay well in terms of costs it costs um, the whole system cost twelve thousand three hundred pounds for uh, the exhaust heat pump itself the cylinder and all the installation including all the pipe work and materials and so on in terms of how much money we got back well we were one of the few people that were fortunate enough to get um, five thousand pounds towards the heat pump um, through the Green Homes Grant, a, a, a thing in the UK which was rather short-lived. Not many people managed to get money through it. It was a bit of a failure, but we were one of the few people that, that did get some cash towards it. Um, and we also got a similar figure from uh, the Renewable Heat Incentive. Um, now, we actually would have got all of that through the Renewable Heat Incentive. The Green Homes Grant didn't actually give us any more money, but what it did mean is that we got it up front. So that £5,000 was knocked off the bill. With the Renewable Heat Incentive, you get paid the money back over a seven-year period. So what we would have done previously was have the entire sum paid over seven years, and instead we got half knocked off the bill up front, and the remaining balance will be paid back to us over seven years. So in terms of what it actually cost us, it, well, what it will cost us by the time we're fully refunded via, via RHI, it will cost us probably about or less than the cost of a new oil boiler would have done. So um, I, in terms of the finances, we did quite well out of it in fairness. The government has newer grant schemes available, or they will, they will do, um, which aren't quite so generous, but they are all up front, so that is helpful. And of course, the cost of air source heat pumps is falling. However, you should, of course, factor in the fact that um, you will inevitably have to pay more to make your house suitable for an air source heat pump. Not necessarily. If you've got a modern house that's well insulated, maybe you've already got underfloor heating, maybe you've already got good sized radiators, you might not have to do anything. And you could take the attitude of um, suck it and see. You know, there's no reason why you have to do it all at once. You could run the air source heat pump like we have and just see how, how you get on with it. As long as you're happy that you might have to make changes. We always knew we, we would, but, um, but that's not necessarily a problem for you in your house. So, you know, you would have to look at the fabric of the building. You'd have to look at... Um, uh, how well insulated it is and if you're going to follow the mantra of the energy consultants which you probably should then it's fabric first you do all your insulation and stuff first do your insulation first then you could do your air source heat pump and then if you have to you can look at radiators and things afterwards now you can I've also kept a, a graph as well as keeping all these figures I'm generating a graph and the graph shows uh, one or two um, oddities and now if I can remember which one's which. So the blue line, the blue line at the bottom is um, the, the usage figure. 
So, so that's uh, you know low in summer as you would expect, and, and higher in in winter time. And then the red line above it is the output. So you can see that we've got a fairly healthy output. And and the the kilowatt hours for those is on the left hand side of the graph. On the right hand side of the graph and the yellow line, we've got the coefficient of performance, uh, our famous uh, multiplier you get with heat pumps. Now that's a little bit stranger. So you can see during the winter months that's hovering quite happily above the uh, line for, for, for 2, 2.1 or something like that. Um, and we peaked at 2.5. Uh, but oddly enough, um, during the uh, hottest part of the year, the sunniest part of the year, the COP has dropped to uh, around 1. Um, and I have to say, I don't know why that is. Um, it could be just the way the heat pump's working, but I would be surprised. Uh, I'm not really sure. It could be, maybe, I don't know. Well, it's not using the heating so much at that time of the year. In fact, I think we even turned it off at all. So the only thing that the heat pump's being used for at that time of the year is generating hot water. And uh, we also have solar thermal panels. So we you know, directly heat up our hot water via the panels with the power of sunshine, which is a delight. Now, one thing I did wonder with this is um, if our unit is counting the electricity for running the solar thermal, but it's not counting the heat output that it generates for it. So it's, it's got usage, but no output, and that would obviously then lower the, the its expected COP. The reason it would count the electricity is uh, for safety reasons, all the electrics for the solar thermal actually hang directly off the um, or the heat pump controller, and the reason for that is if the hot water tank is overheated, if something goes wrong with the solar controller and it's feeding too much hot water in, and it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, it goes above a, a set figure, which I think ours is set to seventy or seventy-five or something. Um, it'll effectively uh, trip. It'll trip out the solar controller, so you don't get any extra or, or too much heat going through. Um, so yeah, so the, the solar thermal is hung off the, um, the air source heat pump control system, so it does draw its electricity. So, I don't know, that's a complete guess. I don't know. Um, but either way, we've got this oddity that the, the COP is, is worse in the summer, where I would kind of expect it to be better. Hey, who knows? So, we're going to be fitting um, underfloor heating in the next... A uh, couple of months, um, and so uh, when that starts, I'm going to draw a line and and mark out, and then I will obviously then keep on recording, and hopefully then have uh, a full 12 months of comparison data with and without underfloor heating, and I'm expecting to see big improvements. Of course, that might not be the case; it might be wishful thinking, um, but there you go. So I hope that's been really useful to you. I hope that's gone some way to explain. Um, some of the facts and uh, figures, some of the thinking behind what we've done and uh, I really hope that's useful to you and has answered some of your questions. If you have any further questions, and I'm sure some people will, by all means slam it in the comments and I will do my best uh, to answer them, hopefully in a more timely fashion. But thank you very much for listening to me waffle, I hope that wasn't too long to hear me drone on and I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much.